Welcome to the Boss You Lifestyle Show. This is a show about learning what it takes to build a superior you. We're talking mentally, physically, and financially. Today, we're going to talk all about money and investing. And Tony, my co host, is going to introduce our guests and get us started. Hi guys, I'm Tony. You know me as the owner of Wolf Fitness Gyms and part of Basu Lifestyle Podcast. Today we have uh, my friend and partner in Wolf Fitness Gyms, uh, Leo Gottlieb here from Gottlieb and Associates. Um, Leo and I have known each other for multiple years now. We started off as friends and kind of just working out in the gym side by side, and it kind of morphed into conversations uh, that the, led the business to, partnership. Exactly, that led to business partnership and investing together, so we can kind of grow uh, what our kind of dream is for Wolf Fitness. Um, Leo, you've spent your entire life, for the most part, in Being a financial, financial planner. planning. And yeah, I got, I got into this profession. Uh, my father got me into it when I was 18 and got licensed. And so it's the only thing. So I've been doing this about 40 years. And uh, I have my own firm, Gottlieb Associates, certified financial planner. Uh, we have probably about 1,000 clients. Um, and it's, it's rewarding getting people to establish goals and then um, getting them to achieve those goals. When you say achieve those goals, like you set up their entire, from when they retire plan or growing up to retirement and then how they can draw down on that after they're retired? Or? Well, well, yeah. So, so you know, so it's like working out. Yeah. If you don't have goals to set, you're not going to obtain those goals. Sure. Okay. Um, so if you fail the plan, then you're planning to fail. That's, that's the, you know, like that. the, the phrase. So, so you have to establish some goals. And, and, and so you have short-term goals, you have mid-term goals, and you have long-term goals. So the short-term goal would be, I want to buy a house in a year or two. You have to save a deposit, or you want to get married, you have to buy an engagement ring. Uh, that would be your short-term goal. And this, that short-term money should be saved someplace very safe. A savings account, uh, a money market fund, someplace where you're not going to lose that money. You want to, you want to uh, resist the temptation to buy crypto with that money, or, or throw it into the stock market, or buy, buy a dot-com stock. So, so you, you want to put that money someplace very safe. Even if it's not going to grow, like it could possibly grow in the market, but you just want it safeguarded somewhere else. The purpose else, so of it is you have an emergency, you have right. a flat tire, you, you, you know, you, whatever it is, you have some cash on hand, so you're not going into debt. Sure. Okay. So a lot of people in their 20s and 30s don't understand anything about investing. Where should they really start? We're talking somebody who's making between 60 and 100K. Yep. They just started their job. They have zero dollars in retirement. How do they start? Where should they look to kind of open a fund and get started in this their investing journey? Okay, so so uh, again, I I always relate everything to working out and exercise, and, and so if you want to achieve goals, uh, uh, when you're exercising, you have to put yourself on a diet. You have to be disciplined. You have to be disciplined to go into the gym three, four, five days a week. No different than, than saving money. When you're saving money, you have to be disciplined. So my rule of thumb is ideally 10% of your um, net take-home pay okay. should always be socked into some kind of savings account. And, and sometimes the easiest way of doing it is just have it automatically. You, you could arrange it with your bank or a money market fund where, set it and forget it. where it just comes out automatically right. once a month and it gets saved. Well, okay. then you're not even missing the money if it's not there anymore. Correct, just, correct. You know, no different than a 401k. Right. Like if your employer offers a 401k, you should begin at that 401 Even though you could be 25 years old, 23 years old, someday you're going to want to reti retire. And so you want to start saving that money for that retirement immediately because if it's payroll deducted, it comes out before taxes and so forth, then it starts to compound over the years. Okay. Should they be just picking random stocks or buying index funds and mutual funds? How should they really get started? Yeah. If they have a low income and they don't have a lot of money to throw in. Right okay. Away. So again, you have to establish goals. So, okay. so there's three phases of somebody's life that, that money comes into play. One is short term. Okay, you have to have an emergency fund. Uh, again, you want to buy a house, whatever it may be. Two might be midterm. If you have a, a child, you want to save for their education. You, you might want to save to buy a vacation home, or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And then third would be retirement. Okay. Okay. So you, you, but no matter what, retirement is the most expensive expense you're ever going to have. So you want to start that retirement plan right away. Okay. So, so, so getting back to your question, yeah, yeah, the okay. best place to put money yep. is exactly index funds. So a mutual fund with a mutual fund, for those that don't know is you could put $1,000 into a mutual fund and then you own a fraction of hundreds of different companies that are in the stock market. So, so basically the three, three main indexes is the S&P 500. So for a very little bit of money, you could start $100 a month dollar cost averaging and you can own a fraction of all those uh, S&P 500 companies. Can you explain just what an S&P index fund is? For yeah, someone yeah. so the top that? 500 companies in the United States, you put Walmart, Disney, Microsoft, Apple, they're all part of the index 500. And those stocks over time will always go up in value. Short term, they're going to come down, but long term, they're always going to go up. 
So, so, the, so the easiest way, the least expensive way to invest is, is a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund, ETF fund that invests uh, strictly in the indexes. So the other two uh, main indexes is QQQ, which is your NASDAQ tech oriented uh, index. Okay. And then you have the Dow Jones, which is the Dow Jones is the top 30 companies that are within the United States representing all the sectors of the economy, transportation, technology, healthcare, so forth. So okay. you said the 500 is a, is, a, is a big pot full of the top 500 companies. So if one of those companies no longer meets that criteria- They replace it. With another company that does. Correct. Okay. So, so, you're so always, you're always getting the best of the invested amount of companies that are available on the market. That's correct. All right. And you're doing that without having to study the market, study the business, study their finances. It, it takes the, the guessing out of where you should be because most people buy a mutual fund based on last year's performance. Well, it's too late. You already missed last year's performance. Right. Okay, so, so when it comes to investing, everybody wants to invest in something that just did good. Uh, you want to be more disciplined, look long term for something that's going to do above average okay. years just out. Did good, you don't know if that means that's its peak. Right? It usually it doesn't replace it, itself, yeah. correct. It yeah, okay. You said something earlier, you said um, it's the best way to compound uh, your to co gaining compounding interest. So for somebody who doesn't know what that means, what is compounding interest on money? Okay, so, so a, a, a bank account, you, you get interest every month. Not a lot of interest, but you get some interest. Um, that interest, you want reinvested. So, so now your $1,000 at the end of the year is might be maybe worth $1,100, $1,100. Right. Okay, now you have that $1,100 starting to earn interest. At the end of the next year, it could be $1,250 and so forth. Wow. So and instead of taking that 100 home with you, you roll it over and it continues to grow on the new higher number. Correct. So with a mutual fund, all these big stocks, they usually pay dividends, they have interest, they have capital gains. And you want to keep on reinvesting the, those dividends, capital gains, and yeah. interest so it buys more shares. And so over time, you keep on accumulating more shares. If you leave that money in, if you take it out, you pay, you pay, you pay capital gains tax on it, right? Uh, you can pay ordinary income capital gains depending on what it is. And if you leave it in, that well, gets What happens with a mutual fund that's not your retirement account? They disperse capital gains every single year to mm -hmm. get reinvested. Those capital gains are subject to an income tax because so, they're so not tax deferred. So you're paying on them? Correct. All right. All right, so we were talking S&P index fund. So the S&P index and most markets right now are down like 15%. Market conditions are weird. We have inflation. 25% now. I figured I'd be nice just in case. <laughs> yeah. So what is your take on where you should be investing now? Should you be dollar cost averaging in? Should you be pulling your money on the side and waiting? What should people do Well, Walmart now? has a big sale. Do you go in and buy or do you wait until the sale's over and you buy? Well, everybody says, well, what if a good sale goes down another 10%? So well, that's then, what... then you go in and buy more. Because you said you're still adjusting your dollar cost average no matter what term you're buying on, right? Correct. So, so you're getting those, sh those shares on sale. Right. Because over time, they're going to go back up. If you're dollar cost average, same thing to 401k. If you have a 401k, who cares what it's going today? You're, you're worrying about 25 years. When you need it. Yeah, so, so, so for a younger investor, you want to be as aggressive as possible as long as you have that long-term uh, time horizon. So just keep buying, basically. You're saying keep, buy the way down, buy the way up. Keep buying. You, you know, you look, at, you look at, say, the S&P 500. You, you have, like, say, Disney, Walmart, mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft, Apple, all these great companies. And these companies today are the same companies they were 12 months ago. They have the same amount of cash on the balance sheets. Revenue streams are the same. Fundamentally, nothing has changed with these companies. The only thing that changed is their price for their stock is 20 to 60% cheaper. Okay. These companies aren't going out of business. No. And you're, in five years from now, you're gonna look back and say, oh my God, I bought Apple for $134. Okay. I like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I better restart my uh, automatic invest. Yeah, never, 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 worry, never worry about what it's doing today. Think long term. But even if it's low right now, you're still saying invest with money that you don't need. Tomorrow. That's correct. Disposable so, income. Yeah. So if you have an extra hundred that you don't need for tomorrow or on the foreseeable, on the foreseeable horizon, put it in there. That's why if it comes out automatically, again, it, you have to look at why you're saving money. You have to have your plan in place. So, yeah. so there's, there's, Again, different place that you always want to be saving for retirement. I don't care if you're like my, my kids when they got graduate college already started their retirement accounts and now they're 30 years old and they have a pretty decent amount, six, six figure amounts of money in their. Um, I mean, 50 bucks is still, it's still enough yeah. to put Yeah, in. and you a lot of times the employer will match the employee's contribution into a 401k. So, so that money you want to be more aggressive. And then you have your short term money for a down payment on a house and so forth that you want to be as safe as possible. So if you work at a traditional company, you like the mindset of take the 401k, have the match what you're putting into it, but you should also then have your own personal Correct. investment account and then maybe another, like you can have your own IRA that you can also max out a year. Well, 401k usually uh, will be, it's going to be easier to contribute to the 401k because it comes out payroll deduct, right. deduct it, you don't miss it, it comes out pre-tax. So if, say, uh, you know, let's use a simple example. 
if you put ten dollars a, a paycheck in, then your pay your net pay is only going down by six dollars mm-hmm. because it's coming up before taxes. I got you. Can I ask you to explain what a Roth IRA is? Because a lot of people yeah. don't understand it, the importance of it, and compounding within it. So if you're young and you're you're not making a substantial amount of income, you want to again, you always want to put money away for your retirement. So the difference between a Roth and a traditional IRA is a Roth goes in after tax and accumulates tax free. So that, again, you're getting all that compounded growth on that money. And, and when you go in to retire, it's a tax-free distribution of retirement. Okay, Traditional IRA, if, you, if you're in a higher income bracket and you're looking for the tax deduction, that all, all goes in pre-tax. And then when you take it out later on down the road, you're going to be subject to income tax. Income tax at the time you take it out or income tax Income tax invested? when you take it out. Okay. So, the, so the theory is when you're, when you're older, you're in a lower tax bracket. Right. You have less earned so it's income. Less of a ding. But, but with what they're doing to the, in today in our, with our economy, who knows what the tax brackets are going to be 30 years later. the way taxes right? continue to go up. So they always go up. if you can up. get into a Roth, you should really be maximizing your Roth. Absolutely. Account. And you can do a Roth 401k through your employer as well. You just you just make that election that you want to go after tax rather than pre-tax. Well, you just mentioned the economy. Um, do you agree with the, the standpoint that where we're currently at right now market-wise, the market and the economy are two separate things? That's correct. So that, like, you agree that the market will rebound before the economy shows the rebound? That's or? correct. So the market looks forward. Okay, so right now the market's down roughly 25% because it was anticipated in January that they're going to raise interest right. rates and, and uh, the economy is going to slow down. Okay, the government wants to slow this economy down. They want employers to start laying off employees. If they make it too expensive for uh, businesses to borrow money, okay, then, then the businesses are going to spend less money into development, research, hiring people and so forth. And so the theory there, which I don't agree with, is then those businesses start laying off employees, takes the demand out of the, the economy. The economy. And it softens everything, and then it brings interest rates back down. So market on the horizon goes up while the economy staggers. Correct. The economy will slowly climb back up to where it was. Correct. So chances are the stock market will start to do better probably six months prior to the economy Economy. doing better. But what happens if you listen to financial news, it's all about promoting yourself. Okay. So, So when the market's down, you'll have the doom and gloom guys predicting the end of the world. Right. The market's up, you have all the optimists. So, so ignore all the, all the noise. And focus on your plan. If I'm 25 and I said to you, I came to your office and said, I really want to start investing right now, but I want to save some more money before I do that. What's your answer to me? Okay. So, so I used to tell people to, to put together a budget. Yeah. Okay. And then we can compare your expenses to your net take home pay. The problem is your budget is a moving target. Your, your electric bill next month might be different than this month. Right. It's okay. So, so it's variable. So, so what's constant is the amount of money you're bringing home every week. So what's most important is if, if that money didn't end up in your checking account, then it's not going to get spent. Right. Okay. So if it comes out before you get a chance to spend it, then you're going to save it. So, so that's why it's usually easier to set that up automatically with your bank or a money market fund or, or a mutual fund where it's coming out same time every single month. And you kind of forget about it you and forget- you're, what you're making every week. It feels like you're just making that hundred, two hundred, three hundred. Correct. So less. You get used to it. Correct. Like so the rule, my rule of thumb is always try to save at least 10%, 10%. of your disposable so there, income. So, so there really is no, there's not too small of an amount for people to start with. You start $50 a month if you wanted to. Perfect. Any amount of money saved is better than not having money saved. So I get, I get people that, that will come to me and say, um, Oh, I made the most stupid investment. I bought some IBM and it only went up like 10% over the last five years. And, and I'll say, um, well, at least you have the IBM stock. You know, having yeah. something saved is better than not having anything saved. You probably would have bought something with it, That's right? tangible exactly. money stored somewhere. Correct. So it's not, like a, it's not like you blew it on something and you're never going to get it back from there. Exactly. You still have an asset. Okay. How should a person decide if they're going to rent or buy a house? That's a good question. Again, a lot of it depends on uh, if, if you're going to be transient and, and moving around. So, so, you know, if your job uh, entails you uh, relocating and so forth, you probably don't want to make that investment into uh, something permanent. Uh, also, it depends on how much money you have saved. I mean, as a first-time homeowner, I think you can buy a house with like 3% down. Mm-hmm. And, and so a lot of it depends on interest rates and, and how much you could afford to spend each month. So, so if you don't have any money saved, well, my son, for example, they got married and they had the 3% and they bought their first time home and the mortgage payment because the interest rates were so low was cheaper than them renting an renting, apartment. Yeah. Okay. okay. And now they have an asset, they get a tax deduction, they're accumulating equity inside that piece of property. So it depends on your financial situation. Uh, um, 
uh, and it depends on how much you could afford each month in, in terms of a payment. Is there a certain amount that you should say someone should spend towards their mortgage or rent each month? Or is that part of the budget that we're talking that's about? That's part of the budget. That's, that's part of the budget. What you don't want to do is uh, buy something you can't afford. Right. And, and uh, so it really depends on your stability of job because mortgage companies are going to underwrite this mortgage and they're going to make sure that you can afford that mortgage because the last thing you want to do is default on the mortgage or the last thing you want to do is fall behind in the mortgage payments because if you once you're late, if you're 60 days late in your mortgage payment, that's going to affect your credit rating for the next three to five yeah, years. It carries. Oh, it carries that long. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, so we talked about that portion of it. But can you explain like what how to look at interest rates? Because people don't even understand like they're buying they're just buying a house. They're asking the mortgage broker. They're yep. saying, "Hey, how much can I afford?" And they're telling them a monthly payment. Well, you're not, but should they be looking at the interest part of it to understand? Yeah, because it? what happens is it's um, well interest rates. I'll give you an example. On January first of this year, uh, a thirty year mortgage, uh, a, a conventional mortgage, you can get for two and three quarters. Yeah. Okay. Today it's seven point one. In so in a, in nine months, roughly ten months. It's the largest increase we've had. So now is not the time to buy a house. So to make that clear to you guys, a $250,000 house in January, your payment was going to be around seventeen dollars to $1,800 a month, including that 2%, 2.5% interest rate. At 7%, 8% right now, that same $250,000 house is going to cost you twenty five to 3000 a month. That's just what the interest does. It changes. You're not buying a property. You're buying a payment for the most part. And the other thing is figure out where you are in the cycle. Like right now, we hit a peak and now real estate prices are going to come down. As a result of COVID, real estate over the last three years, some places went up over 100%. It became overinflated because people were able to borrow that money very inexpensively. They were able to borrow money at two and three quarters so they could afford and a bigger a lot house. Of money readily available. Floating around. A lot, a lot of money right available. And a lot of those loans were adjustable rate mortgages. Yeah. And so what that means, adjustable rate mortgage, is at the end of one term, it could go up 2%. And then every year it can keep on going up two percent, and then it usually caps out at, at a certain value, so or a certain uh, amount of interest. So, so you don't want you want to know where you are in that cycle um, as to whether or not it makes sense to buy now. Because again, if you're borrowing money at seven percent, how do you know that? Uh, and you're on a just rate mortgage, how do you know that mortgage next year is not going to be nine percent? Yeah. And then some people want to like go back and refinance. They're like, well, I'll buy it now, then I'll refinance when it goes down. But they have no idea when it's going to go down. You can't really predict we're at the height of Correct. And increase. you have to understand where we are, too. Uh, you know, when I got out of college, interest rates were 15, 16 percent. Um, and, and then, you know, again, th th we went down to almost zero after the financial crisis, 2008 and nine. So the reason why the, the government raises interest rates and lowers interest rates is they want to stimulate an economy. They're going to lower interest rates, make it easier for people to borrow money. You can finance a car. You, you can buy a house. Uh, okay. It, it, it just stimulates the economy. Um, and, and now what they're doing is they're tightening their belt. Okay, because they overheated the economy by pumping all those trillions of dollars, COVID money out there and so forth. And, and, they, and they knew this was going to happen. Okay. They, they told us it was transitory. You, you know, mean? economics 101, <laughs> yeah. your first economics class, the definition of inflation is when you have too much money chasing too few goods. Okay, so, so the fact that the whole supply chain was shut down and they yeah. printed all this money and gave everybody a check, they knew there was going to be inflation. And they knew, excuse the expression, the shit was going to hit the fan, and now it's hitting the fan. Well, sooner or later, somebody has to pay the piper, right? That's correct. Whether it's in there's no flesh, free there's no cash, free ride, whatever it is. Yeah, no free yeah, ride. There's no free lunch. I mean, so when I come to your office, I'm essentially asking you sooner or later, hey, listen, I want to be able to retire and live without having to live paycheck to paycheck, kind of be debt free by sixty. Yep. All these things. How does how do you how do you see people's lives changing when they hit that aspect in their life? That's a good question. So what happens is when you have children, as you know, yep, they become very expensive. <laughs> they want to participate in sports, <laughs> camps, whatever it may be, travel teams, races, uh, races, <laughs> and and nobody. And, and what they say, it takes over a million dollars to raise a kid from uh, birth to through college today. Probably more because some of the colleges, yeah, are, colleges are you know a hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, so so. Um, uh, you know, so, so it's, it's unpredictable. But again, what's predictable is your net take home pay, right. the amount of income that you're earning. And, and, and as you accumulate a bigger life, that, that, pot, that uh, pile of money starts to shrink because of all your other obligations. Sure. And, and, and so you, you want to do an update, say, every three years or so on your financial situation. Not only that, what's to say that you're not going to get a better job if you, right. like, you own a business that's, that's – um, thriving right now it's growing quickly okay so your financial situation next year is going to be different than what is this year so we keep an adjusting yeah. and and it's like it's again it, it, you have to put a plan together so, so when somebody comes in my office we dissect them 
Okay, we have them write down all their monthly expenses. We look at their, their paycheck, we look at their tax returns, uh, have them think about what their goals are, so forth, and then we try to put the plan together. But you have to be willing to discipline yourself to stick into the plan. In preparation for today's meeting with you, I kind of was looking up, um, I know that we're kind of talking to the 20 to 30 demographic right now, but we have some people who are my age, 30, 36, 37. Um, I read that at 25, if you started with $100 a week into whatever you decide to invest into, now you're going to call it X, you'll amass one to two million dollars of invested capital by the time that you're 55. Now, starting at 35, 10 years down the road, I have to almost quadruple that That's amount right. of investment. But what I'm saying is you can still catch up. You can play catch up if you start. If you, There's no too late. You just have to put more in, right? Always have to be putting more. more. Yeah. You know, as your as your situation, not this. And also, when you get older, all of a sudden your, your responsibilities change. You're no longer supporting that kid. So you can save more right. money for your retirement. Okay, so some people say like cash is king. So they'll just save cash. They're scared of the market. They're scared of the downside. Like you said, we're down so far. Do you think that anybody could possibly starting at 25 save their way into retirement or are they missing out on the possibility? No, you can't, you can't. Well, again, we don't know what future interest rates are going to be, but chances are they're going to come down again. Okay. Because again, the way they yeah. stimulate the economy is they lower interest rates. Um, and, and the interest rates we have today are the highest they've been in, in probably 20 years. So, so, um, so I, I'm sorry, I lost track of your question. No, so we're <laughs> just saying, like with cash, like some people yeah. just oh, stuff so, it under the mattress. Nah, you never want to have cash under the mattress because it doesn't, you, you always have inflation. It doesn't grow. And right? inflation's eating away at that cash. So like right now we have 8% inflation. So that, that cash is worth 8% less than it was 12 months so ago. So a $100 bill is worth 92 bucks. Yeah, so the only cash you want to have on, on hand, cash meaning money in the money market or a savings account, not cash on, in your mattress is the money that you're gonna need, say, for the next six to 12 months. Okay. Okay, okay. And, and otherwise, you should be a long-term investor. So six to 12 months of budgetary needs, stocked away, everything else. You should, should have an emergency fund, ideally uh, three to six months of your three expenses. To six if they wanted to go the safer route, say treasuries, bonds, something mm -hmm. like that, do you recommend certain ones? How do you recommend they look at the interest rates to determine should they be in so, one year, three years, five Again, years? since 2007, nobody wanted to buy a treasury, nobody wanted to buy a, a savings account, a CD, because there's no interest. Now, all of a sudden, I was just saying, you can get a, 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 a seven-year uh, fixed annuity. A fixed annuity is like a CD. Okay. It's guaranteed by an insurance company instead of a bank at 5.1% interest. A year ago, no one thought they can get 5.1% interest. Uh, okay, so all of a sudden, your 5.1% interest sounds fantastic. Right. You went from zero to 5.1. Yeah. It's a pretty good return. So, so uh, 5.1, um, that money will double, let's see, it's uh, 12, about... About twenty years at five percent interest. Okay, so it's still better than keeping it in like your bank account because at least you're getting something. Yeah, so so a savings account pays you the least amount of interest. A money market is made up of short-term treasury bills. It's, okay. it's it's more the the principal is always guaranteed. The interest is always fluctuating based on the price of those treasury bills. Okay, so so chances are you're going to get a higher interest rate in a money market. Or a CD. Okay. Okay. CD. You're locking that money up for a specified period of time. You're, you know, one year, three year, five year, ten year. The longer you go out, the higher that interest rate is going to be. It's actually crazy because right now I was looking at the Vanguard CDs, and actually one in three years is like a similar rate. It's actually like four percent, which, which is, is fantastic. So it's worth buying. Because the short, like we that. have an inverted yield curve right now. The shorter okay. term, ten year bonds yielding higher than the thirty year bond. So it kind of just throws a whole wrench in the system that nobody was. Yeah. Really every, right now, you know, they, they should just let the markets fall where they fall instead of trying to intervene with yeah. the markets. And right now, the out. Fed's intervening with the market and it's throwing everything out of whack. Okay. Is there any, before we move off of CDs, so CDs you would recommend if you can get a decent rate? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, right now, yes. If you asked me six months ago, it would be no. You would because what were you getting six months ago? Uh, like like two percent on a CD max. Okay. So so why even put lock it in for two percent? You're locking in for three years or, you, or five years or whatever it is. And and with a CD, if you break the CD, then there's usually a penalty. Okay. You could lose like the last six months' interest or something like that. Okay. So yeah, my question. That's all good. My question was um like I'm I consider myself a conservative investor. Um, I know that I'm young enough that I don't have to be, but that's just kind of the way that my brain's triggered. I want to be conservative, straight the path. But is there a time, like, would you recommend sub 30 to be a little more aggressive in investing? Especially or? your retirement plan. Your retirement plan, you want to be 100% stock market yeah. at your age. Okay, even at my age, I'm mostly 100% stock market, only because I know going out, just because, uh, you know, say I'm going to retire in, say, five years from now, whatever. 
I know I'm probably going to be living 25 years. Sure, especially okay. So I still have time for growth on that, on that money. <laughs> Plus, my uh, my appetite for risk is probably higher than most people's appetite for risk because you've been in the game. I'm, I'm in the I'm in the business, yeah. and so uh, you have to define you know conservative because conservative means something different for for everybody. Right. Uh, so so you normally what happens is somebody's going to, to invest. We'll ask them. We'll go through a risk profile. And then we'll coach them along the way. So, for an example, your age, if for your retirement money, you want to be 100% S&P 500. You want to be 100% in an index or a growth fund or an aggressive growth fund. So the S&P 500, that's what I consider my conservative. Well, this, anything pertaining to the stock market is <laughs> more aggressive. Right. You, you know, your, your crypto is, is, is aggressive. Very aggressive. Let's go into right. crypto then. What is okay. your take on crypto as an investor? You know, you know what's interesting? I relate it to uh, when the internet first started. Okay. All of a sudden, you had .com everything. Petfood.com, whatever. Pillows.com. Whatever you wanted. Yeah, uh -huh. .com. AOL, American yeah. Online. And, and everybody wanted to get in on the party, okay? Everybody felt like they're missing out. And so, so these Fun companies with no earnings whatsoever, everybody's dumping money in. And, and, uh, and, and then, you know, they go to shoot right up without any earnings or anything, and just on hype. And then people say, wait a second, that's not a real company. It, that company lost money. That company's not even making money. And then, and then the people at the top of that curve cash out and take their profits out. Then the curve starts going down. Then people get scared they're going to lose more of their investment and they take money out. And then you get people that just say, I don't want to lose any more money. And they take the money out and it drives it back down. So it's a bell curve. Okay. So my feeling with crypto is, is we had that top, that bell, okay, came out. Um, the, uh, uh, you know... Uh, the uh, crypto um, went up sixty thousand. Yeah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin went up. Bitcoin, to 60, Bitcoin. 000, Bitcoin yeah, sorry, 69, man. So, so sixty nine thousand. Bitcoin's nineteen thousand. When it's sixty thousand, nobody's afraid of Bitcoin. They feel they don't. They want. They don't want to miss out on because they think it's going to hit to a hundred. Well, fear of missing out. They you think they want to. Yeah, yeah, they feel think it's going to go hundred thousand. Now, crypto is what? Uh, I mean, uh, I think it's it, nineteen. It's about now. nineteen, yeah. and nobody wants to buy it because they're afraid it's going to go down to maybe ten. Okay, so, so what's going to happen is a lot of those smaller currencies are going to go by the wayside. And then uh, my, my prediction is you're going to end up with a few. Okay, like and then that lead the path. And so right now that curve is down. It's not going away. It's crypto, I think, is going to be here forever. Okay. Uh, but, but right now is probably a great time to, to, to buy uh, some Bitcoin. Because so by the way, down, people aren't yeah, interested buying, in it. Would you rather buy Bitcoin at 19 or, or, or 60? But what if it goes to 10? Now you're saying, would you, you rather buy, buy it at 10 you, or 19? Then you buy yeah. more. Exactly. You buy, as long as you have a long term time treat horizon. Treat it like a stock. Yeah, don't, don't, don't treat it like a slot machine. Right. So you want to buy when other people don't like it. Correct. They say, Correct. What's uh, the saying? Buy when there's blood in the streets? That's right. Okay. Yep, yep. And they What's always the they always say it. Go back up when more utilization comes out too. So when, yeah. it, when it has more usage, I think you see you see it go up a little bit. I don't know. They always say as a financial advisor, uh, you know when to get your clients out of the market, when the taxi cab drivers give you stock tips. <laughs> that was definitely happened a year ago. Everybody it, knew every stock. It, it, exactly. I feel like we've been in a couple of uh, Ubers or something where we were told to buy, oh, absolutely. Buy a SHIB or buy something yep, or other. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, uh, so that's what usually when you know you're at peak when the taxi cab driver's telling you what stocks to buy. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and no different when you can tell when you're at a low, um, when you're sick to your stomach that you don't want to lose any more money and you want to get out. So, so investing is all psychological. It, you should uh, buy when nobody else wants to buy and you should sell when, nobody, uh, when everybody else wants to get in. So should you sell when you think you're at the height or like you said before? Depends, kind of depends on your time on horizon. Okay. Depends on your time horizon. If you think something reaches the peak and it's in like just a basic brokerage account, it's something like a Bitcoin or something, should you sell when it's like everybody's going crazy? Again, and it depends on your risk tolerance. It's, it's always fun to look back and say, hey, I made this much money. Yeah. It's never, you, you never hear about somebody bragging about how much money they lost at Blackjack table. True, right. very true. I have a question for you. Let's say I'm 65 or 60, I'm retired. I've amassed two, three, four million dollars, whatever in my investment account, and I want to leave that money for my children or for whatever, generational wealth. How can I support myself off of that money that's in there without touching the principal? Well, my rule of thumb, without touching the principal is very difficult in a low interest rate environment. Okay, so for the last 15, 20 years, we only, uh, people that would normally be adverse to risk for the mm. retirement money were forced to take risk in the stock market. And it worked out well for them over, over the years. So my rule of thumb is, the Leo Gottlieb rule of thumb is uh, no more than 5% monthly distribution. Because chances you chances are, over a, a 
five-year period of time, you're going to average probably more than 5%. You're going to have that low year, and then you're going to have a couple good years. So you still don't ding the principal by taking the 5%. Or even if you go down, that, that, go that it will come back up. Year. Correct. So 5%, I think, 4 to 5% is usually a safe, safe so what number. Was, what would 4 to 5% on 2 or $3 million, uh, allow you to pay yourself a year? So, uh, what, 5% on, on $2 million is what, uh, $100,000 a year. So you can get $100,000 a year without touching that money that you built. Correct. Now, you might have to pay taxes on that money right. that's coming out. But by that point in time, that should be enough for you to at least enjoy a little bit of your life, right? Correct. That's cool. So how long have you been in business? I guess I started my own business in 1989. Okay. So, so uh, how long have you been advising people on finance? Uh, almost 40 years. So you've been doing this for 40 years. So you've had people who have come to you in the beginning and said, I have no idea, I can't retire. And then you have somebody who comes to you after they said that in the beginning. And now they're saying, I've made it. I appreciate everything you've done. I now don't worry about money. What is that feeling like for you? And what's the feeling like for somebody when they finally reach that point where they have financial independence? You know, you know what's interesting? Uh, when I was younger, I thought the age I'm at now was old. Okay. <laughs> And, and, and so now I, I, I uh, encourage, I used to see somebody as 54 years old, 55 years old, and they had a, maybe a million dollars in a retirement account, and, and it was enough for them to yeah. retire. Problem is that person's 54 years old, could live another 35 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and so when you look at it in terms of that, that million dollars is not a lot of money. So, so the longer you hold off for 30 years. having to tap that money, the more secure your retirement's going to be. Um, so, so uh, it is rewarding though. I, I, I mean, right now I have probably, I have hundreds of clients that are retired that are taking a monthly distribution. Um, that, and a lot of them too, they, they retired early. I mean, you're, you're, you're a fireman. You're, you're going to retire in your 40s. But you're not, that doesn't mean you're retiring. That just means yeah. you have the opportunity to collect a pension and do something Step else. Step away from that and move on to the next it, it, Exactly. So retirement doesn't necessarily mean... Uh, never working again. Right. I, I get a lot of people that retire from, like, say, the phone company, Verizon, and uh, they're in their mid fifties, and then they'll take up another job after after they retire. The ones that are in their mid fifties and said, "That's it, I don't want to work again." Yeah, you know, chances are when they're later later on in life, they're going to probably run yeah, out of money. It'll be tight. Yep. Now, what happens at some point? They'll get Social Security, and they can adjust the amount of money coming out of their retirement plan based upon what Social Security's kept compensating. The problem is life keeps on becoming more expensive because of inflation. But a lot of young people don't want to work for 40 years before they can go do whatever. So how do they get to that fuck you money spot? Where they can well, you know like, what? Uh, again, job. <laughs> it, no different than working out. Okay. So if, if they you put more in, put more, in the the more in, you get more out. Put more in. Yep. And let it grow for until you're ready to go. Correct. So it's, it's all a matter of discipline and avoiding temptation. Living within your means. Living within your means and avoiding temptation. Okay. Do you have any... Um, so for people who are just learning or getting interested or need to have an interest in this facet of life, do you have any books that you'd recommend for them to read? Yeah, so there's a couple. Uh, one's called The Broke Millennial. Uh, the problem today, in my opinion, and I have three kids that are millennials, is their work ethic and my work ethic are two different work ethics. Okay, My, my son works for me. He has to be home at 5 o'clock and comes in at 930 because he wants to play with his child. I, I, I used to leave the house at, at 5 o'clock in the morning, go to the gym, go to my office, and then go to my other office in North Jersey, get back 10 o'clock at night, and do the whole thing over again because I was never satisfied with the amount of money I was making. Okay. It's, it's about what you put in, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's about what you put in. So, so, um, so you want to make sure that whatever you're doing, you're always planning, you're always resisting the temptation. Because today, everybody wants to keep up with the Jones. You, know, you see all the stuff on Instagram, somebody driving a fancy car, they have a big house of palm trees and so mm -hmm. forth. Who doesn't want that? But the reality is a lot of those people that get it, okay, end up losing it because they could never afford it to begin with. Can you talk about if you should finance a car? Should you buy only a car you can afford? Because we didn't really get into cars, and everybody likes to have a nice car, especially young people. Yeah, so, so again, uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to uh, leasing a vehicle. Depends on how many miles you, you drive. Um, so, so uh, because if you buy a car, you have to have a su substantial down payment. So, if you want to buy a, a, a house and a car, what are you going to? And you're young, you're going to buy the house. You're going to buy the car. You're better find a house and lease in the car. And you're buying uh, the payment. Yeah, and, and and eventually, as your financial situation uh, changes, and, and maybe if interest rates are low, then maybe it makes sense to buy the car. I, I heard the saying though: you can. Uh drive your car to work you can't drive your house to work so at least if you live out of your car you can sleep in your car they say in, in california, in california it's so expensive to live. they say like husband and wife teachers are living out of their van because yeah. they can't afford a house property man it's crazy yep 
Uh, I mean, I like leasing only because I get bored. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. For me, same here. For me, that's the only that's the only merit for leasing is I know that in three years I'll be bored of this vehicle. And there's going to be something shiny. And, and, and everything to today is designed to last seven years. Right. You know, so a car starts falling apart after in about seven years. And you can finance your car up to seven years now at whatever, I don't know what the you rate can is. finance your car up to 10 years. Oh, I don't know why you would. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would never suggest doing that. But at least, you know, at least what you're doing is you're renting the car for the term of the, the, the period of time you're using the car. So if you want to use a car for three years, okay, you're, ma- you're, you're buying three years of that car. Yeah. And then you hand it back. If you have a business, put it in the LLC's name. You can yep, write it off right off. passive marketing. Exactly. As long as, long as you're not exceeding the miles. Right. And it never makes sense to get out of a lease early because you still owe the balance of the lease. So so sometimes car dealers, they'll try to lure you in and, and with a new car, but you still have to pay off the old car. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll take the balance of the old car and throw it into the loan of the new one. car. So you're still paying for that old car for the next three or four years. And they just make the payment look pretty somehow. They exactly. Always- Exactly. So, so you always want to wait until an end of the lease before you look for another car. Okay. How do we get? A, how does somebody get in touch with Gottlieb and Associates if they are ready to start this journey for retirement planning or investing? Okay. www.investtoretire.com. Invest the number two retire.com. Phone number 800-644-4204. Okay. And I just want to give a quick final wrap up of why you think or what's the importance of starting to invest early. Just, just something quick, easy. You know, here's, hey, here's why you should get started. Here's what you need to do. Money disappears quickly. It's so much easier to save money than to spend money than save money. Uh, you know, once that money hits your checking account or your pocket, it, it's gone. Okay, it's so, a chemical so, reaction in your brain. Exactly. <laughs> man. So, so uh, you want to make sure you, you establish some good habits early on and, and make sure that you, you're disciplined. And, and again, it doesn't matter if it's $25 a, a week or, or $100 a week or $1,000 a week. Just the idea is ideally saving a minimum of 10% of your net take home pay. How old do you have to be to open an investment account? You could be a child. You could I mean, be. Yeah, you're a five two nine. Yeah, yeah. Your yeah. uh, three week old son. Has uh, a five two nine. As money saved. Yeah. Yep. So if you're 18, 19, 20, you're not too young, get in there. You want me to explain what a five two nine is? Yeah, go yeah for why it. not? Okay. College is exorbitantly expensive. Believe me, I sent three kids to college. And uh, now some of the tuitions, NYU is like eighty thousand a year. It, it's not going to ever become cheaper. It's it's only going to become yeah. more and more expensive. So what a five two nine does, it allows you to accumulate money for education. It doesn't have to be college. It, it could be a trade school now, um, tax free as long as you use it for that educational purpose. What happens? So if I if let's say in eighteen years this account that we've opened amasses nine hundred thousand dollars in money for mm-hmm. this, and strictly for educational purposes, let's say he goes to college, it's one hundred and twenty grand or two hundred thousand yeah, whatever, money. and there's a delta left in that account. What happens? You can use money? it for other children. Well, okay, You're, you, they may want to go to a graduate school. Yeah, it could be used for a graduate school, um, and then the balance you take out. And you pay the tax, or if you have grandchildren at some point, you, you can, can put the grandchild on the as the. What happens if they decide not to go to college? You just have to wait till somebody goes to college, basically. Or no, no, or, or hire a. I have uh, right now. Uh, one of my clients died, and the wife got Social Security. She didn't need it, so she put in a five two nine plan for her son. And now the uh, the five two nine plan has about a hundred thousand. Kid doesn't want to go to college, wants to buy a car. Okay, so so they're going to pay taxes on the appreciated value of that five two nine. They don't pay taxes on the amount all the money is coming out because you already paid taxes on part of that money that that went in. Right. Okay, so it's only that appreciation that you're going to pay the tax. So on. you can still take money out. So you can still so it's going to pay ta- and the yeah. kids and the kids in a zero percent tax bracket because right. they don't have any. He doesn't have hardly any earnings. So so again, t- he's taking the money out, put buying a car. Wow. So it's not lost money if they don't go to school. If it's left over, they any money saves out. better than not having any money yeah, saved. Yeah. Yeah. Just step in the right direction. Yep. All right, Leo, thank you for coming on. We appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks, bro. You got it, man. And that's the show. See you next time. See you guys. Later, guys.